Hello, everybody. Um, I, you probably now already know far more about me than I know about you both, so um, I don't know what your particular interests are. Um, I'm always unsure what my particular interests are, so that's pretty much it. Um, this is currently my favourite picture of me. Um, this is me playing chess against a, a robot cat. <laughs> so, <laughs> facing me across the chessboard is a small cat uh, and a camera. Um, and uh, the cat can read your facial expressions. Uh, it does like um, face recognition analysis. And it uses this information to, um, to decide on its playing style of chess. Um, so it changes how it, how it plays chess against you based on like, things like how, how well it, you think it, it thinks you think you're doing, uh, or like how much attention you're paying. Uh, but <laughs> this, is, this is what it thought I was doing. If you know, I was looking at the ball again, I was sort of averagely interested and slightly confused. <laughs> That's pretty much my position on life. Uh, like in general, I think it reads me very well. I mean, you're playing against a robot cat, so it's in a slightly strange situation in the first place. But that is kind of my general take on things. I am like observing, um, you know, generally interested, and uh, I'm mostly confused, and confusion is a good place to be. Um, as Deb said, I, I write. Um, I do technology stuff badly. I'm a terrible coder. I have a master's in computer science. I shouldn't tell students this. I managed to get it without learning to program. I'm still kind of proud of that. Um, <laughs> I've taught myself in the years since, uh, but I'm quite rubbish. But I think I can make I can do things with code and make things happen, which is an important thing. Um, and then I, a whole bunch of other kind of projects kind of spin out of that. Um, and my background is also in book publishing, um, and I spent a long time within the publishing industry and kind of on the edges of it, looking at what was happening to books as e-books and the internet started turning up and everyone got really scared and confused. Um, and the interest in that kind of spiraled into interest in everything, what happens to everything, but particularly to kind of cultural objects, uh, when they become digital, when they're changed by that transformation in some way. Uh, because interesting things happen there, and you can see both in the technologies that grow up around it and also in people's reaction to them. Um, you can start to learn quite a lot about how we feel about, about the digital and about technology, uh, which is something that we're still deeply confused about. And, and confusion, as I said, is a good thing. Um, so this talk is mostly going to be me rambling about things that I'm currently interested in. Uh, and I hope they're interested to you as well. Um, I want to start with this. Because um, this, this is an image that's just been going around my head for two weeks. And when that starts happening, I just kind of keep talking about it until I figure out why I'm interested in the thing. Um, this is a 14th century wine press. It's, sorry, God, that's a really bad photograph. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, right, yeah, no, no, no. Like yeah, go ahead. So, squint a lot. Um, yeah, I obviously pulled this off a really bad tourist website. This one's impossible to see. Look, there's a big tray and there's a huge screw press, and that's all that matters, and that's all that's important about that. Um, this is a thing for making wine. Um, I also really like booze. That's genuinely a, a professional interest, as well as a as a personal one. Um, I used to work in the wine business as well, made wine. Um, and, and it's a beautiful process of transformation, making alcohol. And it's also an incredibly interesting civilizational one, because within the history of alcohol and in the practice of alcohol, you can find out a lot about culture, um, whether that's whether humans first like settled down uh, into civilizations, changed from pastoral to agrarian societies to grow grain in order to make booze, or whether it's you know, when we kind of gathered together into cities um, and it's with the benefit of spirits, so we can drink purified drinks rather than the dirty water. My like, booze follows that civilization a lot. And then there's other things like this, which is uh, reconstruction of Johann Gutenberg's book, a drawing of a reconstruction of Johann Gutenberg's book press. Right? Gutenberg was from the Rhine Gap. He based this upon the wine press. That was the kind of the prior technology that first led to him seeing this that this process could occur, right? this physical imprinting thing. From getting the juice out of the grapes to getting the words onto the page. Um, this isn't one of these talks where I talk about how the, Gutenberg, the internet revolution is the biggest thing since Gutenberg, because that's really dull and, and, and incredibly reductive. Um, but it's about millions of more smaller, more interesting changes than that along the way. But, but the continuity of that action is interesting, that imprinting. And from the Gutenberg press, you kind of end up you know, with kind of art craft printing that we have now, like letter press machines like this, this little standard machine, which some of you might have used. And they're, and they're lovely, lovely things, and you produce kind of beautiful work for them. And still we have this kind of imprinting process that is going on. And the reason I'm talking about this is because I'm, 
I'm obsessed with that gesture, that thing, that continuity, that, that kind of currently ends up at this, in a place like this, which is the DIY book scanning machine. Um, and so the point I'm interested in is the point at which we, we digitize a thing and how it's changed by that transformation. And that happens in a really obvious way with this. So what's happening here is there's a book on this plate at the bottom. Uh, and you turn the pages. And you pull a handle here, and you go, Zoom. And two cameras up here fire and, and photograph the pages. And you digitize this book. And so you have this incredible kind of transformation uh, from, from, from metal type onto the book, and then kind of back out again into the digital, all mediated by this human process of kind of pressing the thing down. This kind of there's automated systems that do this, there's people that feed things to it, and there's a whole bunch of other stories I could tell about digitization. But there remains a kind of continuity between these things that I find really interesting. You kind of see it in, in some of the artifacts of the process. And the artifacts of the process are a really interesting way to look at it. So you can find, you can talk about intangible things, uh, and the digital is a very vague blah, blah, thing for talking about intangible things, but you can talk about them through some of the things that kind of fall out around the edges, those kind of machines, both like images and a whole bunch of other stuff. Here's some other images that I see falling out of the edge of the digital. Um, these ones I love. Um, I call these guys the render ghosts. Uh, they're the people who live inside those architectural visualizations. You must have seen these, right? When, when people are building new buildings and they make those kind of amazing computer-generated renders that look nothing like the final version. Uh, and they put little people in them. Uh, and, and you can kind of see these little people all over our cities. You don't really know where they come from, but they, they live in this kind of half-imagined vision of the future. Um, it's quite an unstable world they live in. It's kind of always slightly under threat. It's always intended to disappear. But you know, maybe maybe they go they go somewhere else and they keep kind of wandering around. And they look often slightly confused um, and, and and quite disturbing at times. <laughs> I find as you get really weird, strange ones, um, and you, you get these kind of these very odd landscapes in these places. Like this is, this is not. There's people floating in the background. Of this. Like, whatever the hell these are, but this is on a hoarding in London, or, or was a few months ago. You know, depicting this kind of weird world that the uh, combination of contemporary architecture and urbanism and planning and all the legal structures around that, combined with technologies of 3D design and. Uh, uh, you know, visualization techniques like this. I feel like I've doubled up the volume since then going back to the back of the Because Because these things that we build are shaped by the convergence of all these different things. There's, there's, you know, there's, I've been told that um, you know, architects can kind of look at buildings now and basically tell you which software program was used to design them if they're done badly. You know, these, these things are that visible in the world. Uh, we get different buildings now because of different versions of Autodesk. Right. Um, and, and that's an that's a interesting thing. And, it's, and, and so I, I look at the people in these and I try to, try to think about them. Um, and, and try and think what, what, what they're up to. So sometimes, they kind of, sometimes you catch them looking back at you. And they look a bit sort of nervous and afraid because of this unstable world that they live in. They spend a lot of time just sort of stood on balconies staring out. That's their, that's their, their kind of main position. I, I did do some research and try and working out something about these guys. Um, and one of the things I found was, was this lot. This is a company called Real World Imagery. Um, um, I'm not sure whether they're... Ex in, you know, so there's, there's millions of these texture sets that you can buy uh, if you're not set in the visualization business. There's all kinds of human packages and things like that. You can purchase them to, to fill your imaginary spaces with, with people. Um, these were real people ones. I sort of managed to narrow it down. So this company is one of those things that floats around the internet. You're not quite sure if it's still actually operating or anymore. They've, got a, they've still got a website. It's pretty old. Um, I, I haven't dared to actually click on the button. Um, and, but, uh, but also I don't need to, because what's interesting about these images is at some point, this, this particular company, in fact, a couple of this particular set called People on the Weekend, is that at some point it sort of went, it went rogue. It got out, it got loose. And it's now one of those things that's just loose out there on the network. Uh, and it's also on every single architect's hard drive I've met. Um, that, that somehow this got pirated sometime in the early noughties, and just it belongs to everyone now. Um, and so they, they've all got this. They've all got this particular set of people. And 
the company is based in Albuquerque, and I, you know, um, this one's copyright 2000. I think they're possibly taken a little earlier than that. So what you have is a set of people, um, you know, in probably in New Mexico, in in the late 90s, photographed on a weekend at some point, who are now walking across hoardings, kind of, and, and living in buildings all over the world, um, and you can kind of. Um, catch them sometimes if we walk you around the city. You'll you know, see these people and wonder, kind of, where, where, where are you from? Where, where, where were you first kind of captured and, and placed into the network? Uh, and do you know? Um, I keep meaning to take out sort of um, newspaper rats somewhere that I think they might come from. I should do that in Albuquerque. And go, like, is this you? Have you seen this woman? Like, do you know that I saw her in London and that she's on a, a skyscraper recording in Tokyo? Kind of weird, these, these just kind of strange floaty images floating through the network. They are, the, the other thing I realized that they are is the Utah teapot people. So I don't know what the Utah teapot is. Um, uh, the Utah teapot is a 3D model. It was created in 1975 by Martin Newell. Um, and it's just one of the canonical objects of 3D modeling. Um, so it came, like the Wendigo, as a default on a huge number of systems. Um, lots and lots of 3D modeling programs came with the Utah teapot kind of in there. So it's become like an in-joke within, um, within 3D modeling circles. It's in every single Pixar film if you look for it. Um, and you can see it, you can almost see it, that's it just floating away behind Homer in, the, in that old Simpsons 3D episode. So. Um, this thing kind of recurs. And then it gets kind of returned back again. This is a project by my friend Dries de Bruggen, who's a Belgian artist and has a design practice called Unfold, which specializes in, in ceramics and the strange lines between the physical and the digital. So he, he, has, he has made the Utah teapot as a physical object, and I've brought it back, um, back out into the world. Um, they're kind of, as I said, they're these kind of emblematic artifacts of, of a weird space in between the physical and the digital um, that, that help us to just kind of conceptualize that as a space, to think about what, what, what could exist in that space, but more importantly, really, about what's happening to things either side of that, um, because most of the traffic is you know, in, in one direction. Most of the traffic is going from the physical up into the digital. It's sort of subliming, it's going into air. And we don't yet know what that means for things. And it's kind of interesting to play around and find out. Um, I have a long running project called The New Aesthetic, um, which looks at things that fall out of that gap, things that bridge that gap, things that muck about in that gap. Um, this is one of the original images that started me down the down thinking about this subject. Um, because I look at this image and I see pixels. Um, I, I can't unsee them. And yet this is a satellite photo of a real location. These are irrigated fields on the Namibian border, on the border between Namibia and South Africa. Um, they're a like, really clear mark of human intervention in the landscape, technological in uh, intervention in the landscape. And yet they look intensely digital to us, even though they're deeply, deeply physical. And I, I'm fascinated by the fact that we look at things like this and that we see the digital in them because we've actually become so acculturated too, to the grain and the shape and the style of the digital, almost without sort of noticing it. Um, and then I see something like this and it completely blows my mind. Um, so I'm walking around East London, the old, the old Docklands area, which is now a big kind of commercial hub. And there's, uh, just, just over here, basically, is Canary Wharf, which is a huge kind of banking centre, massive skyscrapers, all that kind of stuff. And just down the road, there's this collection of very anonymous buildings, more like these ones over here, like big grey sheds. Some of them have windows, some of them don't. Um, and in the middle is this thing. And I noticed that, and I was like, that's something else. What is, what is going on here? Um, because that's not, that looks different to the other thing. And it looks digital, right? It's pixelated. Someone's, someone's up to something here. So I did my research, and it turns out that this is one of a group of data centers on this location. Uh, these are all data centers and uh, carrier hotels, which are basically the, the meeting points of the internet. They're where the, kind of the big pipes come together. And this is, part of, this is the newest building of Linked, which is the London Internet Exchange, which is the third largest hub of the internet. Right? The, the internet is kind of over everything, but it, it comes together and is more concentrated at certain nodes, and this is the third largest node. And they built this. Um, and the architecture of data centers and of network access points is an undistinguished one. Um, they're largely big, gray, anonymous boxes. 
So I was intrigued with what someone was trying to do here. Because they appear to be trying to, trying to make this visible. They want you to see this in a way that traditionally data centers and, and, and the infrastructure of the network does not want to be seen. Um, mostly for sort of security reasons and, and various other kind of things around anonymity and security. Um, this one wants to be seen. I, I ended up managing to speak to the architect. And he said that he was trying to develop a, uh, an architectural vocabulary for, for the network. Because the network is not entirely invisible. Um, it's, a, it's a very physical infrastructure. It consists of large buildings like this. It consists of cables under the ocean. Uh, it consists of kind of vast engineering projects, um, which are almost entirely unseen, like the network itself. But, but this, is, this, is, this should be public architecture. Um, this, you know, if, you, if you think back to the, the grand public architecture of the past, of libraries and banks and, um, and uh, buildings where politics is done and embassies and stuff, most of those functions are now carried out in places like this. But they don't have Doric columns and kind of pediments, and they, they're no longer attempting to kind of ape um, Greek history or that kind of authenticity. And they're looking for a new language with which to kind of express this. And in this case, they, they tried to locate it in the pixel, essentially, uh, as something that, that looks like it is of the network. Um, I don't know whether it's the correct response, but I think it's a, it's a really, really interesting one. Um, and I think a lot about, about those relationships between architecture and the network and the appearance of these things and kind of our place, our place within them. Um, I've been looking for kind of um, uh, remarks and sources and stuff for, for thinking about this. And this is, this is one of my favorite. I was reading a, an excellent book that I recommend called Turing's Cathedral by George Dyson, which is a history of, history of, 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 make, of building computers uh, from kind of the 1930s and 40s onwards. And in this he quotes, um, a mathematician called Harry Reid, who worked on one of the first, the first computers. Uh, this is the ENIAC, which was basically the first electronic all-purpose computer which was built at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in the mid-1940s. Um, and, and, and Harry Reid recalled that the ENIAC itself, strangely, was a very personal computer. Uh, now we think of a personal computer as one which you carry around with you. The ENIAC was actually one that you kind of lived inside. Like this is, this is several rooms, and you kind of had to enter into this machine in order to work it. You know, walls of valves and wires, and you had to reach into it and physically you know, de disconnect and reconnect things in order to make it perform different functions. Um, it was, it was you know, computationist architecture, um, and, and you had to physically interact with it, um, which is not kind of how we think of, of computers in the network now. Uh, I found another, another interesting reference, which was... Um, to the SSEC, SSEC uh, which was IBM's Selective Sequence Electronic Calculator. This is a slightly later, um, uh, but still very early mainframe computer. Uh, this, is, this is 1948, probably taken around then, that's when the computer was completed, and installed in Fifth Avenue, right, in the heart of Manhattan, um, uh, uh, in, a, in, a former, in a former shoe shop. With big glass wall front. This, this, this photograph, interestingly, has actually been airbrushed. There were columns in there. So they, they, they doctored the photo to make it appear even more open than it would have appeared from the street then. And so IBM were you know, putting this machine there as a showroom to, to demonstrate to potential customers. But it was also in use because there weren't many computers around there. And in fact, um, uh, in, uh, in 1949, it was used for a program called HIPPO, which was the first complete sequencing run of a, of a uh, hydrogen bomb explosion. That's what a lot of the computers were, uh, early computers were developed for, for um, targeting and for simulating nuclear explosions um, for the early Manhattan Project and later for the hydrogen bomb project. So in the middle of Fifth Avenue, you have a room of a computer that is quietly to itself and in complete secrecy formulating the, the equations for the, for the building of the hydrogen bomb. Um, it's, it's completely visible and yet its purpose is completely open. No one looking at this machine will have any idea that that's, what it's, that's what's going on. This is our glorious kind of computer future, um, and it's doing something quite dark and strange, um, visible but kind of not legible, and in, entirely unparsable. Um, and, and this still goes on. There's a, a really wonderful sequence of, photog of photographs by a photographer called Simon Norfolk, um, who, um, 
mostly did war photography, quite arty war photography, big, large format pictures of, kind of Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, he also did this extraordinary series of uh, photos of supercomputers. And again, this is at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And again, these are contemporary computers, uh, IBM Blue Gene Ls. Uh, and again, they're still doing it. They're computing functions for nuclear explosions. Um, again, they remain kind of invisible and unlivable, uh, unpositive. And there's kind of really interesting precedents for how people talk about this stuff. Um, and this is kind of one of my favorite stories, the origin of how people think about this stuff, um, which is um, a story William Gibson tells about when he came up with the term cyberspace, or rather when he started thinking about what a cyberspace might be. He actually calls it something else, which I prefer. But he talks about how he's, he was walking, he was trying to think about where he would set his stories. For those who don't know, William Gibson is one of our better science fiction writers, although his, writers, his writing has tended far, far more towards the contemporary than what we used to consider science fiction in recent years. Uh, but back when he was conceptualizing this stuff in the early 80s, it was very much science fiction. And he was trying to work out, he knew he wanted to write science fiction, but he didn't know where to put it, right? Because traditionally science fiction was kind of on other planets and on starships. And that was all very interesting, but it didn't feel right to him. And he thought about kind of emulating J.G. Ballard, who writes about dystopic fiction. Essentially writes science fiction set on Earth. And he thought, that's great, but I, I can't do Ballard, he's too weird. And he was out for a walk, and he saw his kids playing video games. Probably older ones than these, probably. In the big plywood cabinets. And he saw how intently they were kind of absorbed in this. And, uh, and he thought to himself that, that they were inhabiting this other space. He called it a notional space behind the screen. There's, they're, they're in this other place somewhere. And soon that's where we're all going to be living. And that's where he decided to set his science fiction. It's where we get the term cyberspace from. But, the, but this machine in front of them was kind of drawing them through the screen into this, into this other world. Um, and so again, we kind of look for the signs of these, where that network is now, what that infrastructure is, what is this digital place. Um, this is a project I did a couple of um, years ago. About 18 months ago, I don't know if anyone remembers, there was a bit of a, a it, it was claimed as a scandal uh, around uh, locations being stored on the iPhone. Uh, some researchers found that um, the, the iPhone stored every single location lookup it made um, in a uh, unencrypted file on the phone. It turns out you could get into your phone, you could access that. Um, and this was kind of reported as a kind of a terrible scandal, and I thought it was brilliant. Um, because like, I'd be able to know where I was. It had been tracking me for, for almost an entire year since I last updated the software on the phone. And I got this, I got this set, of, um, set of location lookups that the phone had made. Um, I was like, brilliant, I can, I can do something. One of the things I, I do frequently with, um, with data and with stuff is that I, I print it out. That's my background in publishing. I kind of compulsively make books of stuff because uh, it kind of physicalizes them and gives you something you can, you can poke at. It's a totally imperfect and rather outdated method, but it sort of works some of the time. Um, and I, I started, I made, a, I made this book, which is a, a page for every day. And I'm sorry, this isn't the projector, this just is a terrible photograph. Um, there's a better one coming up. But you can see that every page of the, this atlas, essentially, is a page for a single day over the course of that year that I had these locations for. So this is the map of Monday the 19th of July um, in 2010, when I went on a boat trip down the Thames in London. Um, and so the city is here, and then this is the River Thames going off down here. So I was on this boat, and the phone left, looked, did 428 location lookups that day, constantly pinging to work out where it was. Um, and that's all the places that essentially it thought it was. Now I know it's a bad photograph, but you can see they're quite, they're like little clouds. Um, and this is what I wasn't expecting to find in the data. I thought I was making this kind of odd robot assembled diary of my last year. But what I found was, was, was something sort of, to me, almost more interesting. Which was when I look closely at the points, you start to see, and these are kind of like two hour intervals, these weird other patterns within the data. Um, like, what is, what is going on here? Because I wasn't out in the countryside walking in mile wide circles, right? I was taking this kind of, you know, path, boo thing. Um, but, but the phone is, is seeing this other geography. It's seeing the world in, in a very different way to, to the way that I did. And I, I, I sort of understand what's going on. Because the phone is using partially GPS, 
and it's possibly using cell tower location, and it's probably using uh, local Wi-Fi networks when it pokes them, and uh, and it's probably kind of matching those against databases of kind of previous lookups and stuff as well. So there's a bunch of kind of different inputs going in here, but the result is these kind of strange clouds that are kind of crop circles of the network essentially. They're, they're markers of a, a, a different geography that's invisible to us, but that the devices kind of see and sense in the world. And they and, and, and use it to, to see through the world and find out where they are, but, but differently to us. Um, and, and there's a constant process of kind of mediation and translation in order for us to have some sense of what's going on here. Um, and this is this is my favorite structure, my favorite infrastructure. This is the GPS system, um, which is a network of satellites constantly orbiting over us. It's got a vast, vast structure. Um, and, and that's what it is to me. It's kind of humanity's largest structure that we've wrapped around ourselves. We've kind of extended our ability to sense a whole bunch of stuff, like way, way further out. And it stands to me for the, for the larger structures that we all live inside now both physical and kind of noumenal, digital, intangible. Um, like we're inside a building, but we're also in these overlapping electromagnetic fields, and in this kind of soup of satellite signals that are coming down. And, and we, we're building these tools to talk to all of those things, and to navigate those things as well. These, these, they're not just phones and cameras and those things like that. They're constantly enmeshed in this other kind of invisible thing around us. Um, and that's kind of beautiful to me. Um, and you've got to work out where the human sits within this, this process. Um, this is an early example of, of living inside the machine, essentially. Um, this is the mechanical Turk, or just the Turk as he was known, or, or the incredible automated chess player. Um, he was an 18th century <coughs> automaton who was constructed uh, to impress, essentially, the Empress Maria Theresa in 1770, and for about 40 years, he toured the world, uh, amazing people, with uh, uh, his, his chess prowess. Um, uh, it was later, of course, proved that there was a man inside the box uh, at all times. Uh, there was, in fact, one of the, several of Europe's greatest chess players took turns hiding inside the small cabinet, which was incredibly artfully constructed. Uh, if you open any of the doors, you saw these clockwork mechanisms and you could see right through. And in fact, he was sitting on a small sliding seat. So when any door opened, you could kind of move slightly out of the way. More clockwork would slide into place to be where he was. Incredibly, incredibly technical achievement. You forget just quite how complex all the early automatons were. Um, but th there's always you know, someone inside the machine. Um, but, it, but it doesn't mean the machine is, has any kind of less effect on the world, or indeed quite unexpected consequences, or is still capable of I enacting mean, a vast amount of change of people's expectations and emotions in the world. Um, and and uh, I, I see this kind of coming out in, in deeply strange ways in, um, in contemporary society. Um, uh, and, and particularly in the things we build. I don't know if anyone is familiar with task rabbits. It's a service for kind of al algorithmically optimizing cheap humans. Uh, and I kind of hate it. Um, it. It disturbs me on several levels. It basically allows you to buy you know, kind of, um, fractal labor of other people. So if you're, um, you don't have enough money to hire someone to do your shopping or whatever for you, then there's, there's an increasing marketplace for this. And that's fine, I understand the logic behind it, except I also think it, it's, it's an engineer's solution to a number of social issues that doesn't entirely address those things. Particularly there is an optimal, uh, uh, what's the word, an um, uh, enterprise version of TaskRabbit that allows you to hire people to come and, come, come and do filing in your office which seems like a terrifying end run around all kinds of kind of social guarantees uh, and work labor laws and all this kind of stuff. Um, but but this, is, this is the end result of certain kinds of kind of digital and algorithmic thinking. Like obviously this is what we did. And that's fine, but we need to think about what it means quite a lot of the time. Um, it doesn't just happen to cheap humans, it happens to spaces. Um, this is the Amazon warehouse in Wales. Uh, a few days before Christmas, so kind of at its busiest. Um, and it's, about, it's one of the largest warehouses in, in, in Europe. Handles a kind of extraordinary amount of traffic, particularly, as you can imagine, in the run-up to Christmas. 
But what's particularly interesting to me about this space is, um, is all this stuff and how it's there and where it is. Um, this, this warehouse, too, has been algorithmically organized. So if you're, and th this is what Amazon and, and several other companies do really well. They don't just like sell you stuff and, and get it to you. They, they optimize their, their uh, supply chain and their warehousing in very creative and, and technologically advanced ways. Um, so imagine you're trying to optimize uh, how quickly you can get stuff out of a warehouse. And people are ordering a range of stuff. Um, and if you have someone who's got to like, fill a box with a book, a DVD, a camera, a bunch of other stuff, um, you don't want them walking miles around the warehouse to get to the book bit, to get to the CD bit, to get to the warehouse bit. Um, you want those things within as close reach as possible. So things are as evenly distributed across this warehouse as possible. Individual items are all, to a human eye, completely mixed up in order to try and optimize and shorten the amount of time any individual has to walk around that space. Which is brilliantly clever, but it means that your experience of this place must by necessity be augmented. Like you have, a, an individual human has no way of finding anything in this room. Uh, it can only be seen, essentially, through, through kind of machine eyes, through, through some kind of augmentation. Um, and if that software goes, then this whole place just kind of completely collapses and, and falls apart. And there's kind of many, different ways and, and strangenesses like that manifests. Um, there's a term for spaces like this I've discovered. Um, and, and this is another good example, um, which is an airline. This is the canonical example used in a book called Code Space uh, by Rob Kitchen and Martin Dodge, um, who are kind of software engineers and architectural theorists. Um, because again, it's a space that um, is what they call co-produced by people and architecture and software. Right? If, if everything's working fine, you turn up here and you check in, your boarding pass thing uh, you know, goes through and you go through. If the software fails, right, this is just a big shed full of really angry people. <laughs> There's no, it completely fails to be what it is supposed to be without, uh, without the actions of software as well as architecture, um, code space. Um, but, you know, as I think you might understand from where I think about things, I think that concept is applicable to a far wider range of things than just architecture. In fact, pretty much everything we do is mediated to software. I'm very definitely here, largely due to software, and, and so are most of you, and so is this space. Um, and this is the point at which I say all of our metaphors are broken. Um, uh, by which I mean we possess kind of excellent instrumental metaphors, but very poor appreciative ones. As in, we, we can work out how to describe things up to a point, and we can say what they do, um, but it's very hard to communicate the experience of them. Um, you know, if, if you tried to explain photo sharing to someone centuries ago, you can go, well, the, the picture here, I can show to someone over there, um, and, and kind of instantly, and uh, it's a bit like you know, sending them a postcard, but quicker. Um, like we can kind of augment the things that, but that in no way captures the experience of living in a world where photos are shared constantly. Um, like we don't have the, the ways to talk about it. Um, but, but I think we can kind of approach conceptualizations of it by kind of coming at it through all these different disciplines. I think that's why it's really important now to be a generalist, because the internet is like accused of making us shallow and making us low attention, and I think that's rubbish. I think we play in a far kind of grander sphere of knowledge that, that does not have even that metaphor itself is kind of broken. Um, that there's something else going on here. The network allows us to do that. We that, it, that is genuinely new. Um, I want to talk about one more one more subject, um, which is drones. Um, I'm assuming there's a few drone projects around this place. Is that right? Um, yeah. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, drones are hip right now. Um, that's, that's you know I think. Uh, and they are, and they're very interesting. They're interesting to me for kind of a number of, a, a great number of reasons. And I'm interested in all the kind of like quadrupedal stuff, and I'm in, interested in the kind of individual, um, the, the things that individuals can do with them. There's some really interesting stuff there. But I'm also kind of interested in, about where they come from. I'm always particularly interested in, um, in the relationships between military and civilian technologies. I'm interested in the, the relationship between surveillance and violence, in particular. Um, it appears to be true that all surveillance platforms are kind of eventually uh, weaponized in some way. 
there's a strong relationship between kind of the viewer and the viewed and the, the perpetrator and victim. We've we'll always find that in these kind of deeply unequal systems. So I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in military uses of drones. But I'm interested in this world because of what they say about the network, about what they say about the agency that technology gives us and what we're, like, what we're capable of doing with that. And you find strange things. Um, you find people burning technology in effigy, um, which, which we haven't seen for some time. Uh, there, haven't really, there hasn't been a lot of that since kind of the smashing of the mills by the Luddites. It impl um, that's giving me the eye. If you can think of other examples, yeah. and she'll tell us a bit. Um, so, so that image itself is, is kind of powerful enough. And so I'm interested in looking at why these things are so disturbing to us. And I think it's similar to some of the network effects. It's this, this invisibility and this deliberate obfuscation. So I do things like this, for example, um, which was, uh, this was a project a few weeks ago in Istanbul. Um, and it's not the first one I've done, I did one in London as well, of, of taking the outline of a military drone and, and painting it on the street. Um, as a, like the books, it's a really desperate, like, lo-fi way of simply making these things visible. Because we don't see them. Um, they kind of happen very, very far away from us. Um, I've, never even, I've never seen one of the machines in, in reality in front of me. Um, and until I did the research, I had no idea how big they are. It turns out they're quite big. Uh, this particular model, you know, which is the, the most popular of the predator. Popular is a difficult word in this context. Uh, <laughs> which is numerous uh, in, in current military use. Um, but this is, this is a process of attempting to make these things visible and therefore to, to understand them. Because like with the book, hopefully by, by, by working the, with these things and, and, and making them seen, we also come to understand something about them. Um, Um, because more and more, what technology is doing is, is kind of building this kind of one-to-one -one map of the world. Street view is the, the obvious kind of example of that. But we're mapping huge and huge amounts of stuff in kind of into the network, and, and how it reflects us and who does that is very important. Um, it, it does reveal us kind of quite a lot as, as kind of who we are, and, and that's that's why I'm always interested in, in technology. So you can always get into this fight about whether there's anything genuinely new happening here, or whether, like, you know, as plenty of people will say, there is nothing new under the sun. And I think it's, again, more complex than that. Um, I think that, uh, that, that technology allows genuinely new behaviors and genuinely new things happen, um, but I also think it reveals to an incredibly, incredible degree. Just because there is nothing new under the sun doesn't mean people have noticed. It doesn't mean that we've seen these things before. We haven't, we haven't experienced these things for ourselves. And that's, again, what the process of kind of making visible is about. So the, the, my latest project was to use, um, to use these technologies, these mapping technologies that allow all of us to see the world uh, and connect it up with the drone thing to, to make this project, um, which, is, uh, which posts landscape images of the locations of drone strikes in Afghanistan, Somalia, and Yemen um, currently, though I'd be interested in getting some more data in or do other ones, um, and post them to Instagram. Um, the, the kind of the drone's eye view on the world, essentially. Um, because these are unseen landscapes. You know, we hear a lot about these places, but I've never been there. Um, and I'm fairly unlikely to go. Uh, and I'm, I'm more likely to go than most, frankly. Um, and so we hear about these places, but we don't see them. And yet, at the same time as we're using technology to bomb these places, we're also building the technology to see them and to interact with them better. And we need to bring those two things into, into sort of a more closer alignment. Um, and, and, and we need to do that with the technologies themselves as well. I think that's really important. Like these, the, 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 there's, there's a bunch of technologies at work here. There's satellite imaging, there's mobile phones, um, there's, there's flying death robots, and there's Photoshop, uh, sorry, and there's um, uh, uh, Instagram and photo sharing, right? And, and these things have an evolving grammar of their own. The media has its own way of speaking about these things, and if we can pull those things together, then we can speak about these things, I think, sort of more clearly. Um, to do so in the language of the medium itself makes a far more powerful statement. Um, I was listening to an architect called Keller Easterling, talk the other night, who's amazing, I and mean, you should read her book. 
um, Enduring Innocence, uh, and the essay, and her forthcoming one was called Extra Straight Craft. She's an architect who's very interested in, in what has also been called sort of junk spaces and strange trade spaces and extra legal zones, like kind of special economic zones, uh, trading zones. Areas of the earth where we kind of suspend normal laws largely in order to do something slightly d dangerous with capitalism. Um, where we, you can kind of bend the normal legal laws of a state in order to kind of get something done. Um, and, 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 it, and these states, these places contain a lot of this kind of architecture. There's a natural affinity between it and the kind of Rendigo stuff we were seeing earlier. Because these places are shaped by software. They're shaped by, by software that's running in stock markets and they're shaped by um, the supply chain stuff that kind of Amazon uses. They're kind of massive extensions of those kind of physical spaces. Um, and, and I'm interested in what she's talking about because I'm interested in how, about how you know, we can do things in those spaces as well. That this is not something that is simply done to us or to people, but it's something that technology will allow us all to act. And she talks about this, this, this phrase that I use earlier, the soupy matrix of the world that's always intersecting interests. Um, there's another guy, Dan Hill, City of Sound, who I wrote to look up, who talks about uh, the dark matter. Um, the dark matter is kind of everything that isn't, you know, the bricks. It's all the legal structures around the stuff, and it's all the intersecting impacts that are somewhat invisible. Um, and East Lingua says that um, architects need to stop making kind of pretty stones in the water and start looking at what the hell the water is itself and starting to shape that. She talks about an architecture that has a disposition, right, that has some kind of agency in the world that by placing in it can kind of change and redirect those flows. I think that's possible within kind of media and technology. And we're starting to see the ways that might be done. Um, this is a guy, a physicist at CERN, talking about the Large Hadron Collider. They go around and around. <laughs> um, the point is that we're building these, these kind of insane tools. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we've known for quite some time that the tools, uh, we shape the tools we build, and thereafter those tools shape us. But something else strange is happening with our tools now. They're closer to us. They're more like augmentations. And the, the back and forth between them changes far, far quicker. Um, uh, and, 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 and there's a there's a shared kind of collaboration, I feel now, between us and these technologies that can allow us to do more with them. Um, and, and where we should be doing that for me is in these, these strange intersections of the network, these places where we can just see the seams of the physical and the digital and try to sort of understand what it might be up to. Um, stop now. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah, new projects are uh, like looking at how biotech is changing the way we view like life and people. Um, I don't, but I know some people who do have some kind of there's some really interesting like gene hackery biotech stuff going on. What's the name of that? Uh, the 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 the, um, the competition for kind of agile. Right. Yeah. Um, those kind of projects. Agile. Um, I, I know people who kind of work in that area. It's not my area. I find it deeply scary. Um, like brilliantly so. We should be doing totally scary things. Um, I think we should probably make the printers work before we start making like bacteria work. Um, but generally, it's, yeah, it's going to be one of those scary West features that's coming. What can you do in math or computer science and how that lead to becoming a writer technologist? Um, around the mid 90s, the web was really cool. I mean, it's still just, it, was, it felt it really felt like the kind of exciting future that all the cool people I know were doing web design. Um, so, I did completely the wrong course in doing computer science if I wanted to be a website. But, kind of, an approaching university, that was what I wanted to be, I wanted to be a website. I was also incredibly frustrated, and still am, between the divide between arts and sciences, and think it's ridiculous. Um, and, but made the sort of took the executive decision to do computer science and carry on reading books rather than, you know, studying the arts <coughs> and, and not having access to kind of technological knowledge. Um, that's still a problem. Um, by the time I finished, I hated computers so much uh, that I went to uh, I went to work in publishing, in, in book publishing, because I wanted to get back to literature. I think computer stuff was rubbish, and I, well, it is. 
And then I discovered that I was like one of the very few people in the publishing industry who wasn't terrified of computers. And when anyone mentioned ebooks, didn't go, ah, oh, it's never going to happen. Which is generally, and still is in some quarters, the response. Um, and so slowly the two things sort of started coming back together again. It became about where literature and technology met, um, and kind of everything has followed on from that. So you studied literature as an undergraduate? No, don't, don't quite have that system in the UK. Uh, I, stud I studied it formally only up till 18, and then, and then I've sort of done a four year master's program up to that. So uh, projects like uh, Dronestagram and the um, uh, painting of the drone on the sidewalk are meant to be provocative. Uh, what kind of what kind of impact have you seen uh, from projects like these? Um, the drone painting one has been complex. It seems to have been of more interest to kind of um, like they've always been done in quite design contexts. So the the, the Istanbul one was um, as part of the Istanbul design. Uh, BAL, and I don't really know what the reaction to that has been. I'm waiting for a response to it. Uh, it'll be, I hope it'll be interesting, because it's on quite a major street, uh, which is gratifying. Uh, and also it's part of an exhibition that includes tons and tons of kind of crazy new technology um, in this big eight-story old school building. You have lots of kind of 3D printers and, and um, that sort of tech, you know what I mean, kind of nice tech blog stuff. And you go all the way up to the roof, and then you look over, and then you see this thing in the street outside. So I, I hope, but that, that's, those are quite localized. Drone Scram, on the other hand, seems to have hit somewhat of a nerve. Uh, I mean, it's only four days old, but it's, it appears to have been discussed quite a lot online. And it's interesting in the, the context in which that happened. It initially got picked up by, um, by sort of tech blogs, and it started to move over towards kind of politics, and it's now heading into kind of newspapers. And it's, you know, it's to be relies on a whole bunch of existing data done by far better you know, researchers than me. As most of the data comes from a non-profit called the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, you know, who are genuinely investigative journalists and have gone out and dug up the information about these things. Uh, and all that information has been available online for some time. And all I've done is visualized it in a slightly different way in a slightly different medium. Uh, and apparently sometimes that's what it takes to, you know, I, I, I looked and, you know, it was on a newspaper site this morning, uh, you know, the UK's largest newspaper, who has basically talked about drones never, um, except occasionally to say when they're, you know, supporting troops or whatever. You know, has never talked about this aspect of drone warfare before, and they are now, and that's a good thing, I hope. Um, and there must be something in that, as I said, about doing it in the media. In, in the medium of, of, of the network itself that gets spent attention. <coughs> so the when you put a project like that out there, like the drones, what's going through your head? Because you're kind of putting yourself out there as like, this is something I need, and do you, especially something so volatile, you don't know how people react to it. Um, I'm just kind of curious when. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> a little bit nervous. Uh, but you, like, I, when I, Put it out there. I blog it and you know make a tweet. Uh, so that's um, you. You don't expect attention. Uh, that's not the bit you plan for. You, <laughs> most stuff gets ignored. Um, you know, I, I, I do a lot of silly things online. Most of them don't appear anywhere. Um, these ones are obviously slightly more directed and political. Um, they come out of a kind of quite a complex for me set of background issues. Um, I, I genuinely have no idea what the result is going to be. You know, I could quite easily have been doing that on Instagram forever and no one noticing. Um, the analysis genuinely tends to come later when you kind of look at who pulls what out of a particular interest. As I say, the, the, work is, the work is always in the making of the thing, uh, and that's kind of how I, how I figure out how I feel about the thing. Um, and, and putting it out in public is a big part of that. Doing work in public and inviting a response is kind of quite key to that, I think. Um, so, with your like, with your iPhone, like plotting the data that your iPhone tracks of like where you've been, and like I saw, I missed the point you're talking about, but you have some facial recognition stuff. So I'm wondering, have you like done anything examining like, um, like unique identifiers, kind of like biometrics or anything like that? I haven't particularly done anything like that. I've followed quite a bit of kind of stuff around facial recognition and tracking yourself, and um, it's it's part of that general interest in surveillance. That's 
kind of massive. Um, there are people out there doing kind of really interesting stuff around it. Um, people like Adam Harvey in New York, who kind of looks at the, the aesthetics and kind of facial recognition and looking at kind of the aspects of kind of hiding from it. Um, the, it's, again, it's a, it's a thing that's coming. I, I, I live in London, which is the most heavily surveilled city on earth. Yeah. Uh, and you're kind of constantly aware of the gaze of the camera. Uh, and once you know, facial recognition stuff starts getting hooked up to that, it gets very, very interesting, very, very fast. Um, but, uh, but it's also still, it's, it's sort of the domain of hackers at the moment, uh, and doing really interesting stuff, and just kind of playing with these technologies. Um, but, you know, I mean, Facebook paid a billion, uh, you know, dollars for, for Instagram, and they did it for the faces, right? <laughs> that's, that's what they want it for. Uh, so that, that, that data is coming together so uh, So you talked a lot about us putting a lot of information into the digital world. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that we do is we put our ID in the digital world, like with our Facebook uh, profiles and Twitter and stuff like that. How do you see it coming back out of the digital world into the physical world? Uh, sort of the transformation between digital and physical with our identification. Uh, do you mean identification or identity? Identity. Yeah. Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, I see it's been kind of uh, how people present themselves. I don't think we do actually much yet. Um, I think we've kind of carried on pretending we're the same kind of socially networked individuals in, in the old sense of being socially networked. And I'm not sure how much it's kind of bled through back yet, but, but with the same with the previous question. I think that that's kind of going to change, uh, particularly when we start to have a, a we start to have a far grander, growing sense of what our identity is worth to companies. Um, if someone figures out a better marketplace for that information, um, a bet, you know, because at the moment we we sell our identities very cheaply online. Um, if there was a better marketplace for that information, if there was some way that we could, you know, the value could accrue back to us, if, um, if, you know, the true sort of value of identity labor, uh, that, that, that's going to get quite interesting. Yeah, it's a good place to wrap it up. Thank you very much, James.